good morning paris and uh, good afternoon india uh, we will now start the meeting and i request uh, dg ppsc to welcome all the participants uh, here physically and virtually so uh, good afternoon uh, respected uh, secretary mopng sri pankaj jain sir senior officers from ministry of uh, petroleum and natural gas and uh, omcs senior functionaries from uh, international energy agency iea and uh, the panelists and the guest speakers also the various stakeholders who are joining from various locations very good afternoon and let me welcome all of you to this webinar being jointly organized by iea and ppsc so this uh, very objective of this uh, uh, session today is to update the 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 update the global natural gas and uh, lng market in 2023 and the global outlook for 2024 so the reports released by iea also highlights the recent developments in the indian gas market and also the initiatives towards the low emission gases sir as we all know that uh, the ppsc and uh, iea has been closely working together in the knowledge sharing and one of the such report was released in the india energy week in 2024 in goa that india oil uh, market outlook uh, 2030 so we expect in fact we are keen to have such similar reports for gas also indian gas market outlook also for a short term or long term projections uh, by iea so we expect that iea may come out with such reports uh, shortly and today session uh, definitely uh, you know a webinar would facilitate a discussion on the impl uh, implication of various developments in the gas sector and opportunities for future collaboration so once again i uh, you know let me uh, welcome all of you to this webinar thank you so much thank you sir uh, to take the meeting forward i invite uh, mr dennis head of coal gas and power division of ia to setting to set the context of the meeting today thank you very much for the kind invitation uh, and indeed i'm happy to um, to take it over from here from paris uh, where we don't have the heat wave uh, i hope the indian participants are okay despite the very high temperatures you're you're facing um let me indeed uh, provide a few comments to set the context for this um webinar um the first one is and this is probably obvious for the indian participants but just to stress it for those who are from outside india India has a significant and growing energy demand, uh, driven by a population of 1.4 billion people, uh, which is about one sixth of the world's population. And it's not just energy that's bigger that we expect to grow, but also the Indian gas sector. Uh, we expect to be one of the world's fastest growing gas markets in the coming years. Now, this growth that we foresee for the Indian gas market is in line with the Indian government, who has an ambition, uh, a stated ambition, to increase the share of natural gas. in primary energy from less than 7% in 2023 last year to around 15% 15 by 2030 so that means more than doubling compared to last year to 2030 the share of natural gas in india's primary energy mix now those are the opportunities that we see for gas in india we all see some challenges uh and we have seen some of those challenges uh being realized in the last years one was a lower than expected domestic uh, gas production we've seen of course the very high international lng prices especially in 2022 after the russian invasion of ukraine um and we see there's growing competition uh, from other sources of energy in particular for power generation we see coal which is cheap and widely used and we also see solar which is booming and which has large potential of course in in india so those are challenges which the gas sector or gas development in india um is facing Now if we zoom in on recent developments and we look at the first quarter of this year uh we've seen actually impressive growth of gas in India. We've seen the LNG imports increasing by 25% compared to the first quarter of last year. So year on year comparison first quarter this year compared to first quarter last year. We've also seen the total gas consumption in India rise by about the same 23% um and this is driven mainly by fertilizer production and also again by the power sector. Now we're very happy at the IEA to be cooperating here with the uh, PPAC and to we were honored to welcome a number of esteemed Indian private and public stakeholders in this webinar as well as international uh, representatives to participate in the workshop uh, today. 
As was mentioned in the opening statement, uh, the goal of the webinar is to address the challenges and the opportunities for the gas sector in India in the coming years. And we'll have the following setup. My colleague, Carol Etien, whom you see on the screen or you'll see her shortly, uh, she will present an update on the global gas market uh, and a forecast for 2024. Then our consultant, Alay Patel, will take over and will focus more on the Indian gas market. And then after this, we'll have a panel discussion about growth markets, partnerships between global and local stakeholders, and with a special focus on the role that policy can play to promote development of the gas sector uh, in India. Our hope with this webinar, our aim is to provide valuable insights on how energy policies can support and can shape India's energy transition, and in particular, as was mentioned in the opening statement, by promoting the production and the use of low emission gases in India's energy mix. With this, I will finish my opening remarks and hand back uh, or hand over to Carol. Thanks very much, uh, Dennis, for your introduction. It's a pleasure to be here today uh, for this workshop. As you mentioned, Ale and I, uh, and I will start uh, with a brief overview of the key elements of our latest analysis. So I will give an update on the evolution of gas markets in 2023 and a look ahead to 2024 from a global perspective. And Ale will then give um, a special focus on India. So as a reminder here, um, is a link to our latest gas market report. Uh, it was published at the end of April. Our gas team at the IEA publishes quarterly gas reports, which are available free of charge on our website. And these reports provide an in-depth review of market developments globally, and then by sector and by major region, with a particular focus on the balance between gas supply and demand. And as part of the IEA's Low Emission Gases Work Program, these reports generally include a section on policy and market developments related to biomethane, low emission hydrogen, and emethane. So let's start with a look at prices. Um, this slide gives us a wide picture on the past few years and really puts into perspective the easing of market fundamental we have seen over 2023 after the gas su supply shock uh, that followed the invasion of Ukraine and the sharp drop in pipe gas deliveries from Russia to Europe observed in 2022. So 2023 was a period where gas markets moved from a peak structural tightness and uncertainty in 2022, with a very high price volatility to a gradual and near continuous rebalancing. So last year, TTF in dark blue on this chart for Europe and GKM prices in light blue for Asia felt to levels around 70% below their 2022 averages as market tension eased. Uh, but despite this significant rebalancing, prices remained in 2023 well above their pre-crisis levels in Europe and in Asia, and they remained high compared to prices in North America. That's what you can see here um, as Henry Hub in green. And this means that North America on one side and Europe and Asia on the other side continue to face a substantially different gas price environments uh, with all the implications that this can have on demand and especially uh, for the industrial activity. So let's have a look on the supply and demand dynamics uh, behind, behind this easing of fundamentals to better understand what exactly has driven this fall in prices. So on the supply side, first, 2023 uh, was another challenging year for global natural gas trades with uh, losses exceeding uh, additional volumes coming on the market. So here we show the year-on-year -year changes in key pipeline and LNG supplies globally. And we see that Russian pipeline deliveries to Europe in 2023 were again significantly lower than in the previous years, 
as that's the dark blue segment uh, you see on the chart. And Russia sent more pipeline volumes to China through uh, the pipeline power of Siberia 1, that the upward volumes you can see in green on the chart. And even though these volumes have been increasing, they didn't offset the volume removed from the global market since 2022. And in addition, incremental LNG supply was relatively small in 2023. Uh, this is represented by the light blue bar on the chart. And we saw projects ramping up in Mozambique FLNG, Calcasio Pass and Freeport in the US, but underperformances at a number of projects globally scaled back the energy supply increase. So in Russia, we saw Yamal LNG and Sakhalin 2 uh, with extensive maintenance programs. And in Africa, uh, we saw Nigeria and Egypt uh, facing feed gas availability issues. So this shows that the supply side was relatively weak in 2023 and that the international gas trade still had significant catching up to do after two difficult years. And this leaves us with the demand as a key element in easing market tension in 2023. So here uh, we are looking at year-on-year -year changes in global demand by region and by quarter for 2023. And um, we see two different trends. So the first one is in Europe, in dark blue, um, we saw an overall 7% drop in demand for the whole year. And this drop uh, was linked to a few factors, notably uh, relatively mild weather, keeping heating demand low, and also um, the growing of renewable power generation and improved nuclear availability, um, leading to a 14% drop in the power sector gas demand. So some of these factors were also at play in major Asia-Pacific markets um, in green on the chart, especially regarding the nuclear availability in Japan as plants were progressively back online. And on the other hand, China and emerging Asian gas markets, that's what you see in light blue, returned to growth in 2023 thanks to a more favorable price environment that made gas more competitive in the power sector and somewhat in the industry as well. So as a, re as a result, the market saw a return to growth in the second half of 2023 at the global level. It was driven, as we, we have seen, by China and by emerging Asian gas markets. And overall, it resulted in a growth of around half a percent in global gas demand. So it was a return to growth, yes, but certainly certainly not enough to upset the one and a half percent drop we observed uh, in 2022. So what we see is that the market rebalancing that started in 2023 is really thanks to this moderate demand side picture as supply additions remain uh, relatively modest. So now what about 2024? Um, so let's start with uh, the demand side and by looking at the far right of the chart, uh, we are forecasting growth in global gas demand of about 100 BCM in 2024. Uh, that, represents, that represents a 2.3 Person growth compared to last year. And industry is expected to account for around 45% of this incremental gas demand in 2024. So, but looking at the regional split of this demand growth uh, can tell us a bit more about a key question how much of this growth is fundamental or structural? And how much of this is continued recovery from 2022 crisis and weather effect? So if we look at the far left of this chart uh, to focus on residential and commercial demand, um, we can see that much of these growth is set to be in North America and in Europe. So these two regions were 
mild weather had a significant downside effect on, on the demand in 2023. So much of this growth is linked uh, to normal weather assumption in our forecast. And the remainder of this sector, uh, residential and commercial growth in other regions is linked uh, to increased use of gas in, at a distribution level. If we move to the industry now, uh, we come to the second factor here, uh, the recovery effect. A good chunk of the incremental demand in Europe for industry is simply recovery from the deep cut in demand from 2022 and the minor growth of uh, 2023. Next is the power sector, and we've got two columns here on the chart to show opposite trends we, we are expecting for 2024. On one side, higher gas burn in the fast growing Asian markets mainly is um, partially offset by the expected declines in Europe. So globally, gas demand in the power sector is forecast to increase, but only marginally. And now we are not showing it here, but let's have in mind that almost 40% of this growth will come from Asia Pacific region. And the bulk of what of uh, that will come from China, which will uh, represent almost a quarter of the total global uh, growth. So China continues to be a primary driver of growth in our outlook. So we expect the supply to increase as the demand grows. Um, we are expecting an extra 16 BCM of LNG on the market in 2024, uh, up from only 12 additional BCM in 2023. So that's a 3% increase year on year, uh, but it's still below the average uh, we observed during the period from 2016, 2021, where there was more than 30 BCM of incremental LNG supply by year. So geographically, these volumes will be more distributed than in 2023. North America will continue to be central. We're expecting improved feed gas condition in markets like Nigeria, uh, new facilities ramping up like Congo LNG and uh, the startup of Greater Tortu off the western coast of Africa. We expect as well lower maintenance in uh, Russia, even though we don't consider any production from Arctic LNG2 for 2024 in our forecast. So LNG supply is rising, but we are not yet at the heart of the next big wave of LNG supply, which we expect to come online uh, from the US and Qatar from 2026 onwards. And on top of what we are showing here, we, we should keep in mind that we are expecting stronger piped gas deliveries uh, going into Europe and into China uh, that should further ease market fundamentals and decrease market tensions. So all you know, um, incremental supply on the global market should be sufficient to meet the expected return to demand growth, but there are uh, a number of uncertainties that can impact uh, this forecast. So the good news is that gas underground storages in Europe and in the United States close um, the past heating season with inventories well above their five years average. So in Europe, in Europe, as you can see here on the chart, the storage uh, sites were close to 60% full at the end of March, with inventories standing 45% standing above their five-year average. So this means that um, to meet the 90% filling target set by the EU by the start of the next winter, gas injections of 35% below the five-year five -year average should be sufficient. So this reduction in injection demand over the coming summer could contribute uh, to a further improve, improvement in market fundamentals. Um, but however, this picture uh, can be easily clouded by the current geopolitical situation. 
Um, to mention this, just a few of them, uh, since January this year, LNG transits through the Red Sea has totally stopped. And this is due to the increasing number of attacks in the Bab al Mandad uh, Strait between Yemen and Djibouti. And this, together with the reduction in transits uh, through the Panama Canal due to historic drought, has had a significant impact on uh, physical and LNG flows. On top of that, uh, Russia has targeted energy and gas assets in Ukraine, including underground uh, storage facilities, and there are an uncertainties about Russian gas um, transit through Ukraine for uh, the next winter. So gas markets are improving, um, but are exposed to geopolitics, and uh, this is something that we continue to monitor closely. So I'm now going to hand over to Ale uh, for a focus on India. Thank you, Carol. Thank you for the great uh, global overview of what's going on in the global gas and LNG markets. Uh, as, Carol, as Carol mentioned, I'll be talking more around India. And before I go into the IEA's outlook for natural gas consumption in 2024, um, I felt that it was prudent to take a step back and look at what actually what happened over 2022 and 2023. So um, in 2022, we saw soaring gas prices really impact India's natural gas consumption. And this happened across the board. Uh, so whether it was the power sector, the uh, Alec, can you or... speak a little louder? Sure, sure. Am I, is it clear now? Better? Not much. For the others, is it okay, Carol? Uh, hold on. I think I'm audible to everyone else. At least. In fact, we are in a conference room, so we need a little louder voice. Sure, sure. No worries. Yeah, so as I was uh, saying, the, the reduction in gas demand was across the board. Uh, whether it was the power generation sector, refining or pet camps, we saw uh, demand hit by anywhere between 20 to 33 percent across those sectors. And uh, the lower prices led to fuel switching as well, and that put a squeeze on LNG demand. So LNG imports were down by 17 percent year on year, which was one of the steepest declines ever seen in India's history. And overall, primary gas supply was down. Alay, by we can't hear you. Um, sorry. Ali, let me check if uh, we can do anything this side. We can all hear you clearly, but uh, yeah, L let me check. Okay. Yeah. Um, can you hear me now? Better by any chance? Yes, you can continue, Ali, and I'll I'll just uh, work on. Sure. Yeah, thanks. Um, thanks, thanks. Ali, it's so, a, Ali, it's a, Ali, it's a little bit muffled. Maybe try um if you can without the headphones or putting the mic closer or something, that might help with the muffling. It's not the volume. It's I think the muffling is making the volume a bit less. Um, uh, but we can try on our side as well. Thank you. Hello, uh, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Much better, thank you. Okay, all right. Yeah, so I, sorry about that. Um, so that was a snapshot of 2022. Now the situation changed quite a bit in 2023 and we've seen a gradual recovery and, and an improvement in consumption through the year. Um, so as prices cooled off, uh, we saw consumption increase across all the key sectors led by the industrial sector and petrochemical consumption was up by over 25% as well. Um, uh, the imports were also positive because of the low price environment. So LNG imports spiked by 9% and uh, primary gas supply, overall gas supply saw an um, increase in 2023 as well. Uh, what was also interesting to see was uh, the spot LNG cargoes increased by almost three to four times as compared to the 
uh, previous years during the end of the year period as well. Uh, so overall, as we have entered 2024, now we are in the second quarter, there is good momentum uh, for the gas, section, uh, gas sector. So if Carol, you could jump to the next slide. Now overall, uh, for 2024, the IEA expects natural gas demand to grow by 7% year on year. Uh, and this consumption will really be led by, uh, again, the industrial sector, specifically the fertilizer sector. And because of the ongoing heat waves as well, we are seeing a lot of LNG flow into the power sector as well. So that is aiding in gas consumption growth. Uh, but if you take a step ahead and look at the medium term outlook, uh, there are other factors which are in play as well. So we are seeing a lot of developments in the city gas distribution sector. A lot of investments have been outlined across the entire gas value chain, ranging from the LNG storage, ports, all the way to the CGD sector. So this should all aid in uh, increasing or sustaining the momentum in gas consumption. Having said that, more measures are definitely required uh, to aid in the full deteriorization of the market. And if we are to achieve a uh, 15% share of gas in the overall energy mix. And that's a topic I'll touch upon with our panelists later on in this session. What's also worth pointing out over here is that only the past two year and a half years, they've displayed that prices can be extremely volatile, LNG prices. Uh, and India relies for half of its needs on LNG imports. So it's really important to channelize the domestic resources. Now that obviously starts with domestic gas production and the ministry and the government have been taking measures for at least the past six to seven years uh, to revive uh, natural gas production. But hand in hand with that, uh, there is also an increasing focus on developing uh, India's domestic low emission gases, uh, namely the compressed biogases and green hydrogen. Uh, and we're seeing some momentum from the policy side behind the low emission gases currently. So if I talk about CBG, which is compressed biogases, uh, the story with CBG really kicked off in 2018 with the Satat scheme, which was focused on setting up production facilities for CBG. Um, but that at the time was not really addressing the other parts of the CBG value chain. But we are now seeing that happen. Uh, so late last year, there was a mandate to blend CBG into the city gas distribution uh, system uh, with blending expected to be mandated up to 5% towards the end of this decade. Uh, there's also support on the upstream fronts, so that by upstream I'm referring to the feedstock situation, which was cited as a key challenge. So the interim budget had some provision uh, in forms of financial support to procure biomass aggregation machinery, which should help uh, focus on the upstream supply chain. So what's really heartening to see is that the entire value chain has been addressed from the government side as far as CBG is concerned. Now, again, these are early days. Uh, there will be cost challenges, there will be technological challenges, but at least the right direction is being attained as far as CBG is concerned. Uh, and we're seeing some of the impacts of this uh, as a lot of the private companies have announced plans to set up CBG facilities. I mean, in Europe, PE capital is starting to flow in this sector, and there are a couple of small companies who are trying to set up CBG in India who are also trying to attract PE capital. So all in all, the momentum is there. Uh, if we talk very quickly about green hydrogen, the National Green Hydrogen Mission was announced early last year with an outlay of over $2 billion. This was followed quite quickly by incentives for manufacture of electrolyzers and for increasing green hydrogen production. Uh, by August, there were the guidelines, the standards were defined for green hydrogen, although uh, more details on the methodology are still awaited. Uh, but most importantly, guidelines for pilot projects to utilize green hydrogen in the steel, shipping, and transport sectors, those were introduced early this year. Uh, and I think the learnings which come out of these will be really vital towards how green hydrogen can be utilized um, overall uh, in India's energy mix. Um, but again, on both fronts, there is a policy momentum, which is really great to see. Um, with that, I'll just pass it back quickly to Carol, who can help uh, sum up the entire section for us. Thanks, Ale. Um, so our last slide gives us the key takeaways of this presentation. Uh, I won't go 
deep uh, into details to leave room for discussion afterwards. But just to sum up, um, 2023 was another tough year for gas markets after um, the 2022 crisis, but low demand helped ease tensions. And we expect total gas demand to increase by 2.3% in uh, 2024 compared to last year, driven by fast growing Asian markets and by the industry sector. So the global gas market is expected to grow and to rem um, but to remain tight in 2024 with geopolitical risks uh, set to increase. And as for India, um, gas consumption has shown signs of resurgence since 2023, uh, driven by an increase in LNG imports due to lower spot prices. And this trend is expected to continue and even accelerate this year. And finally, the role of low emission gases will be key in terms of uh, local production, uh, security of supply, and uh, support for the country's energy transition. Thank you. Um, thank you, Carol and Nalai, for crisp, brief, but informative presentation. Now I will request Secretary uh, Sri Pankaj Jainji for his remarks. Thank you and uh, really wonderful to be here. And special thanks to IEA for putting together this report and sharing it with us. And uh, as was mentioned uh, earlier that I think this, this work actually complements the uh, uh, oil outlook, which you which had been done for India, so it, it really sits quite well with that. Uh, so yes, I think broadly I, I see where uh, where India is vis-a-vis -vis rest of the world, the kind of developments which are happening elsewhere. So you know, all those those are uh, uh, in a sense they validate our own understanding and our own expectations around it. Uh, the thing is this, as a as a you know. For India's position in the gas market, or rather for any country really, a few things do matter in terms of making sure that gas uptake increases. Gas supply, local gas production, and in India's case, uh, production of low emission gases or alternate forms of gases, whether it's coal bed methane or it's compressed biogas. Uh, both of them, uh, the, the alternate gases may be small now, but they are also increasing fairly rapidly in terms of the, the fact there's much more interest around them. And uh, in a sense, their green credentials are even stronger than uh, what natural gas offers. So there is considerable enthusiasm in India in terms of uh, uh, putting them in the mix. So, so, so that is not a challenge in terms of getting the gas supplies either through LNG or local production. Local production itself... Uh, Many of more more facilities are coming on stream, uh, and uh, between this year and next, we expect again a further ramp up in uh, local production. The uh, the story really over the last three or four years, also in India, has been the fact that uh, regasification uh, infrastructure that has uh, more much more of it has got commissioned. And uh, many of our contracts, which we are now signing, give us the flexibility of choosing where to, to uh, regasify it. But alongside, I think pipelines have made it possible for many of the regas locations to become even more viable, as well as a tariff for pipelines. So A, the infrastructure in terms of pipelines, and B, the tariff for regime for pipelines actually makes it so much more uh, uh, it makes much more economic sense to start uh, looking at it. Uh, and the last mile distribution. The last mile distribution, both in terms of what we are seeing in city gas, but also increasingly, and that is what we'll probably see in the next few months uh, around uh, uh, LNG being sold as LNG as a trucking solution. So that, that is also going to um, uh, start making headway and uh, you know, we, we anticipate some... Um, fairly quick uptake around that as well. But there are two ele other elements which are key to uh, increasing use of gas, which will have an impact on demand. One is how prices behave, and we have some sense, uh, again, as to what international prices are going to look like and uh, what we expect, because it, 
Uh, global demand, if you tell us, is just about is going to increase about two point three percent. We also have some limited supply coming in. Uh, we don't know what two thousand twenty four winter will look like in uh, in uh, places like Europe and so on. And uh, even with this talking, we don't know if it's an early winter how that changes. But be that as it may, I think for us one big challenge is really going to be uh, continues to be rather the and and that uh, is the taxation on gas. So domestic taxes on gas uh, is still work in progress, and that is in fact affecting the use case for natural gas. We we are uh, uh, this, this this is a federal country, so yes, it involves negotiations with states, it involves persuading them and you know, bring them on board. It is it is again a uh, thing we are working on. Uh, we are again. Cautiously optimistic that we should be able to, you know, come come up with some kind of um, via media around this. And uh, in 24-25, if we are able to do that, suddenly you will find that the switch from less clean fuels to natural gas starts also making economic sense, not just a moral sense or not just a environment footprint sense. So that is something which uh, uh, I mean, I don't you can't hold me to it in terms of uh, you know any timelines or any any set date. But yes, it is something which we anticipate we should be able to make substantial progress during the course of the year. So if we can get natural gas and the GST, for example, and the, uh, then we we would see that uh, it suddenly starts making much more sense to shift to natural gas. Because all the other elements are in play, you have the infrastructure, you have the distribution, you have the pipelines, everything else is there. Uh, so, so if that, that really would be the final final piece. And therefore, uh, some of the estimates around our total consumption, to my mind, uh, do carry an upside risk if uh, we are able to uh, track the taxation issues early. So that would be a caveat from my side. But uh, I think we have to also simultaneously keep an eye out on on what things look like beyond the next two years, because a lot of people would be making investments as to what uh, they so investments for two years from now are being planned now, particularly on the uh, user industry side. And therefore, if uh, we need to work out ways of uh, giving them some more visibility on what. Uh, Price bands might be, or what price ranges might be. Uh, that would be something which would be very helpful. So maybe you know, uh, in the next iteration, um, we, we could perhaps look at something like that. So, so I'll stop here. But I think uh, the work which has been done so far and shared with us has been very useful. So thank you very much for uh, putting it all together. Thank you, sir. Thank you for valuable comments. So now I hand over to Alay Patel. Uh, who will start the uh, panel discussion around this subject? Over to Alay. Uh, thank you, Mr. Kumar. Um, so today we have a panel of uh, six members uh, joining Carol. Uh, we have Mr. Sanjay Kumar from Ali, you have to unmute. Yeah. yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. 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 So we have uh, Mr. Kumar from Gale, uh, Mr. Das, Samajit Das from Adani Total. Uh, we also have Nakul Raheja from Shell Energy India. We have Mr. Utpal Maru from India Gas Solutions uh, and Mr. Vivek Mittal from Petronet LNG. Uh, welcome all. Um, uh, there are a few themes I would like to go through during this panel discussion, starting with uh, maximizing gas consumption in India. Uh, and since we have a very uh, rich panel here of six members. I would request that we keep our responses uh, as crisp as possible uh, so that we can go through all the themes. Um, so I'll start off with my first question here, um, which is what measures could be implemented to maximize growth in gas consumption to reach the target of 15% share of natural gas in the energy mix by 2030? Um, this question is for all the panelists. So. Uh, if I could request Mr. Sanjay Kumar to start us off, and then, then I'll work through the rest of the panel. Good afternoon, Alay, and thank you, Alay. Uh, 
it's always a pleasure to be in a panel discussion, more so when this is being organized uh, by IEA. And considering that uh, Secretary Petroleum uh, has already, you know, touched upon so nicely on the fiscal, the taxation part of it, the only other measure and more so, you know, when we are uh, talking to an outside world, what I was thinking, what is very important development which can help us grow in our uh, gas consumption. So other than the taxation part that uh, we have uh, just now heard from our Secretary Petroleum and Natural Gas, what I believe is some sort of mandating, mandating for shifting of fuel to uh, shifting from the alternate fuel to cleaner fuel in the form of natural gas and uh, some sort of permissions, you know, whenever we are laying gas pipeline, the permissions are slightly difficult to come in our context. But more important is if the if the world, LNG world gives us opportunity to enter into LNG sourcing contracts based on Indian gas pricing, which is presently, you know, West India marker is one such marker. We may also be developing such markers in future. Very important, you know, factor for growing Indian gas consumption would be that sellers are willing to give us contract, long-term contracts of 5-10 years which are based on West India marker or on any other gas index generated out of Indian business with a ceiling and a floor. Now, ceiling and a floor is a big wish list, but at least the gas markers could be Indian market. This is my take on, on this uh, from 6% to 15%. Thank you, Mr. Kumar. Um, next, Nakul, if I could ask you to share your thoughts on the topic as well. Thanks, Ale. And uh, of course, it's a real privilege to be here with this panel today. So thank you for the opportunity and the invitation. Uh, I think the Honorable Secretary, as well as uh, Sanjay Ji, have set out uh, the comments along this quite clearly. Uh, so let me just build on some of the points which have already been made. Uh, of course, as the, sec as the Secretary said, gas in GST itself will be a massive step forward. Uh, but I'll just kind of build on that as well as what Sanjay just said. There are two other main themes, I think, that need to be uh, progressed. Um, one, the Secretary referred to, which is the growth of infrastructure that we've seen. So a lot of excellent work has taken place in the last few years to roll out the pipeline as well as CGD infrastructure to different parts of the country. So a lot of the demand growth that we are seeing fructify right now and the fact that we are now nudging close to 200 million cubic meters a day of, uh, of offtake is a result of that infrastructure. That needs to be taken forward. And as uh, Sanjay Ji just said, to me, that's an execution play. So we really need to focus on removing the bottlenecks that will allow for a faster rollout of those pipelines as well as CGD networks going forward. Uh, in that, in particular, I think, creating the right conditions for industries to be able to offtake uh, material amounts of gas will really move the needle in terms of gas offtake uh, in the country. Sanjay mentioned uh, mandates. Um, well, you know, the mandates is one way of doing it. The other way uh, is making gas available on more competitive terms in general across the value chain. And that includes giving customers more choice of suppliers as well, which will allow for greater competition to take place in the marketplace. So that's one area, more infrastructure growth, more access to customers, as well as more access to suppliers uh, on the part of uh, 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 customers as well. The second area is building out new opportunities for gas, particularly in the power and transport sectors. Uh, in your uh, uh, slides, Ale, you were showing how much more gas has been flowing into the power sector in India. And if you were to actually include 2024 data, then the numbers are even higher than we, what we saw in 2023. Uh, so the power sector is literally pulling record amounts of gas uh, into the sector right now as we speak. Uh, I think that provides an excellent opportunity going forward because we are adding more and more renewables to our electricity mix, which will need a complementary partner to balance that load and gas is the best friend of renewables in that endeavor. So as our demand grows and as our need for flexible power supply grows, there's an excellent opportunity for gas in that space. So renewables plus gas 
uh, you know, contracting on that basis in a bundled way on the power side can be quite a powerful uh, step forward. And the final point on transport, and the secretary mentioned this as well, there's a huge opportunity for LNG to displace diesel for heavy duty vehicles. It's the cheaper alternative and the cleaner alternative. And if we can make that happen, then that will drive a huge amount of additional gas demand growth as well. Thanks, Nakul. Thank you so much. Um, Samarjit, if you could also help us with uh, what you think. Yeah, thank you, Ali. Thank you for uh, IEA and PPSC for inviting us to the forum. I think a lot of good points have already been mentioned uh, by Nakul, by the Honorable Secretary and Sanjay Ji. Uh, one small a couple of points uh, I would like to make is the biggest issue is the affordability of LNG and uh, because LNG is volatile in the years to come, what uh, customers need is how the affordability can be increased. Of course, uh, GST versus VAT is a very big uh, win for gas. Uh, other smaller points I would like to highlight is uh, customs duty. So currently, India has two favorable treaties with UAE and Australia, whereby there is no custom duty on LNG. Maybe the same could be, you know, extended across all the, all the countries. I mean, exempt uh, custom duty from LNG. That gives, uh, you know, the buyers of LNG a rather a bigger choice rather than resting it to, resting it to a few countries. The other thing is uh, currently in the regas terminals, what happens is that there cannot be any in-tank swaps. So as a result, the optimization of the regas terminals is sort of limited because an in-tank swap means a sale and that itself is tax inefficient. In fact, barter is a sale in most of the states. So maybe when we move to GST, that is something which can be enabled. So two specific uh, suggestions from my side. Thank you, Samarji. Thank you so much. Um, Next, Utpal, I'd really love to hear your perspective on this matter as well. Uh, thank you, Alay, and thank you, thanks to IEA and PPSA for giving us the privilege to give our views on this panel. Um, and as a as the Honorable Secretary has just mentioned, you know, in his speech, and, and I agree with almost everything he said. I think I'll give you know, from, if you want to go from six to fifteen percent, I would want to touch two or three aspects. Some of them have been touched, but you know, one is you have to also look at the supply side of the equation. If you want to increase consumption, you need to increase supply of gas. And I think to that extent, if you look at the, you know, if you look at the history, uh, governments usually in developed gas markets, they leave the pricing and, you know, where the where and who the gas is consumed to the market forces. What they really focus on uh, is to create deep liquid markets and competitive gas markets with strong regulation. And I think towards this end, if you want to give the right incentive for new players to come in and explore more in this country to increase domestic supply, I think, you know, we need to, you know, relook at the policy on the way how we price gas um, and consume gas in this country. Um, the secondly, and, and, you know, this is more important, even today at 6% of the gas and primary energy mix, India is importing roughly 50% of its gas demand. If you were to increase it to 15%, then you can clearly see, you know, how much more imports you will need. Secondly, um, I agree fully with the point Sanjay ji made that, uh, you know, for LNG for India markets, right now we are dependent on foreign benchmarks. And we need to develop a sort of an Indian benchmark, if you will, for consumption in India. But the thing, if you want to get there, what you will need to create, and again, I go back to the examples in Europe, let's say UK or continental Europe, where um, if you, if I go back to 90s and 2000s, um, it was dominated by long-term oil indexed or CPI index contracts. Uh, today, LNG is being sold in, in those countries indexed to their gas price benchmarks like NBP in the UK, TTF on the continent now and the continent. Now, how did that happen? It actually happened as the as the markets deregulated, it became deeper, more competitive liquid markets. Uh, customers were able to access gas from multiple uh, suppliers on a short-term basis. And that gave them the confidence to go out and purchase gas. Today, lots of customers actually do not go purchase gas because they don't want to enter into a take or pay contract, for example. So if you, if you really want to get an Indian benchmark, then I think the market needs to mature to that point uh, wherein you know people 
are confident enough to sell on this benchmark. Um, you know, taxation has been touched upon, so I won't say anything more on that. Um, and you know, I fully agree um, with the point that Nakul um, Sanjayji also made on mandating because you know some of the gas consumption, if you look at CNG in Delhi, was driven by mandates, and it's not mandate for mandate's sake. I think it is an imperative today if you want to clear the urban air pollution problem and the associated health risks, then you need to, you know, you need clean burning fuels, um, automobiles, you need clean burning fuels on the road. So that's sort of, you know, what I would have to say on, on this topic. Thanks, Uttpal. Thanks so much. Um, Vivek would love your take on this as well. Yeah, thanks, Ale. Thanks very much. And firstly, I would like to express my gratitude to IE and PPAC for inviting me. I think a lot have been talking about affordability, infrastructure, but uh, another aspect is volatility. We have seen over the last four years, there has been huge volatility in the LNG markets. Indian imports were way back in 2020 were 26 million tons, which declined to 20 million tons in 2022 and have started rebouncing. So it's all a function of price. And another important critical aspect in this infrastructure creation is gas infra uh, storage infrastructure. If you looked at developed economies or the European Union, the gas uh, storage is to the tune of around 105 BCM against a consumption of 330, 335 BCM. This is a very critical aspect which is missing in the Indian, Indian context. Because today, if you look at uh, the storage, it's purely in form of LNG storage tanks, which is close to only 2 BCM currently. And our consumption is close to 65 or touching or almost 70 BCM now. So something we need to focus on gas storage, because in a volatile period, when prices go uh, up, then we can draw down from those storages. And when the prices are low, we can fill those storages. A uh, similar mechanism has been adopted in EU. There is an aggregate EU mecha uh, sourcing mechanism wherein all the buyers collaborate and they do a depend based on the pricing and they do a coordinated effort for purchasing. So something of that sort we need to implement. Of course, good thing in India, we do not have a heating requirement. So we need not draw down on the, but we have a requirement, more requirement like current environment when temperatures are touching almost 48, 50 degrees C. So we can actually use those storages during this period when the prices are low. We can actually, when the hydro prior goes up, we can fill those storages, keep it and use it uh, during the period when the when the demand is high in India. Got it. Thank you so much. And uh, finally, Carol, if you could help close this out, uh, this question out with some quick thoughts. Carol, you are mute. Yeah, yeah, I was on mute. Thank you. Um, I, I think that um, on the storage um, uh, side, uh, we can maybe mention uh, that India has uh, no underground storage uh, sites for now, only limited energy storage, as you said, lower than uh, 2 BCM. Uh, but in May 2023, the country uh, energy transition uh, advisory committee um, suggested to develop uh, strategic gas storage uh, to strengthen uh, the country's energy security or supply and to reduce uh, price volatility this way. Um, so I think uh, even though there is no uh, actual underground storage, um, I think there is a momentum uh, to, to reach um, more, um, more uh, capacity of storage. So I think it's a good point. Thank you so much, Carol. Um, next up, I'd like to take a slightly bigger uh, dive into LNG specifically. Um, so, Carol, if you could just set some context, because uh, we're seeing lots of LNG supply projects which have taken FID uh, and some which are already under construction. So, what is the outlook for LNG supply basis that? So, yeah, um, we made a focus on uh, the, the year to come in our presentation. But I think it's important as well to have a wider um, uh, picture of uh, what's going on on the markets for the, um, the end of this decade. So if we consider all the uh, projects that have reached FID or have already started construction worldwide for LNG, we expect additional liquefaction capacity to reach close to 250 BCM per year by 2030. Um, it was a bit less than 200 BCM over the 2015 to 2019 period. And it was a bit more than 100 BCM uh, per year over 2009 to 2011 
So um, this is a, a very important uh, increase in liquefaction capacity. And this must be compared to the current size of the market. Uh, if we have a look on 2023, last year, uh, 540 BCM of LNG were produced worldwide. So uh, we, we are talking about a, a, a very huge um, wave of new uh, LNG capacity coming online. And this capacity would be built mainly in the US. Um, uh, the US are going to represent 40% of this incremental uh, capacity and um, from Qatar as well, um, because Qatar uh, with the, the different stages of its North field expansion will add close to 70 BCM of new uh, liquefaction capacity, which represent 30% of the total incremental. So this significant increase in LNG production capacity could potentially ease market fundamentals and have an impact on spot prices uh, by the second half of the decade. And this could create um, additional demand uh, for LNG um, in price sensitive uh, regions such as India. Thanks. So with that context uh, around the supply glut of LNG that is expected and potential lower prices, uh, I'd like to get some thoughts from Vivek and Nakul particularly. Um, so with this uh, potential growth in LNG supply, uh, what contracting and procurement strategies do you think will be adopted or can be adopted to maximize LNG penetration in India? Uh, maybe Vivek, we can start with you. Thanks, Ale. I think uh, as, as Carol mentioned, that uh, there's going to be a huge amount of capacity addition to the liquefaction, mainly from US and Qatar as geographies. Of course, there's Mozambique, which has been delayed. Some projects have started, but it's delayed. So overall, we believe that there'll be almost 130, 140 million tons of capacity addition as far as LNG is concerned in the second half of this decade. But having said that, uh, it, it is a good for economies like India because uh, it will lead to a sustained and a economically viable prices and this will bolster LNG demand in India. So from a contracting perspective, I think uh, we, of course, can have a mix of long-term contracts and spot contracts. But if the expectation is that the prices will go down to $2, $3, it, it may touch down, but on a sustained basis, it is not possible because if you look at US LNG, it is a kind of swing exporter because it has capability of switching on and off, unlike uh, conventional LNG projects, which are integrated with exploration and production. Because over US, you source LNG on Henry Up, gas on Henry Up, and then liquefy it. So that if, if, if uh, and most of this US LNG has also been tied up by uh, pro, uh, LNG portfolio players and traders who, who will like to optimize. And if they don't recover even their variable cost, they may actually like to pay off the liquefaction tolling fees rather than uh, exporting that LNG. So, we can't expect that LNG price will go to ultra low levels of $2, $3 on a sustained basis. Uh, so as such, from an economy like India, it is good to have a mix of long-term and spot. Maybe 60, 40 or 70, 30 could be an ideal ratio. Similarly, uh, diversification in terms of indexes like Henry Ebb and Brent, we can have a mix of both, both the indexes as far as sourcing is concerned. So in nutshell, we need to have a portfolio and a balanced approach rather than focusing on one particular region, one particular territory, or one particular index. Over to you, Nakul. Thanks, uh, Vivek, and very important point actually on US supplies. So thanks for that. Um, I'm not gonna be as brave as you and hazard a guess on where prices could be, uh, because I think all of us who've been in this sector long enough uh, realize that that is a hazardous business at the best of times. Um, uh, but indeed, as Carol said, I think what everybody can see is that the current tightness that we're seeing in the LNG market, uh, even as we said, we're adding 10, 12 million tons worth of uh, LNG supply this year, compared to that, the LNG supply that's set to get added in the second half of the decade is many times of that. So at least the current tightness uh, that we're seeing in the market uh, should ease, which should only be uh, good news for countries like India. I fully agree with that. Um, again, building on the point you made, Vivek, um, uh, I think customers really you know, need to look out for their individual needs and do what's best for them uh, in terms of what contracting strategies they should follow. Uh, I mean, what works for a steel customer will not work for a power customer. And that will not work for a city gas customer, right? So 
um, I think there is now much more sophistication in the Indian gas market in terms of available options than there was even a few years ago. So therefore, I think this is a great opportunity for customers to come forward uh, and create solutions that work to serve their unique needs. And as Vivek was saying, I mean, whether that's linked to a particular index uh, or, you know, Brent and Henry Hub were two that he mentioned, but there could be a whole host of other indexes that could be considered as well, depending on what a customer particularly needs and works for them in their construct, right? For example, we spoke about LNG as a, uh, as a transport fuel in the heavy duty vehicle. That's an oil index alternative that it's displacing. So an oil index LNG price makes sense. In the power sector, your alternative is renewables and coal. So an oil index price doesn't make sense, right? So again, we have to kind of mix and match and find the appropriate solution that works for that particular end use segment. And there are enough now opportunities uh, and sophistication out there. Index is one choice. The other one is tenor choice uh, as well. Uh, and the way I like to address the tenor question is, for your structural needs, you should try and contract supply on a long-term basis. You should not be exposing your structural need to the volatility of the spot market. Right? So if your needs are long-term and enduring, then you should look to try and tie up that proportion in long-term supply, which is inherently less volatile, uh, you know, rather than trying to time the market and seeing what's the bottom uh, price that we are getting. For more opportunistic demand, and for optimization needs, you should keep a chunk of your portfolio open uh, for spot and short-term purchases. And then you mix and optimize uh, between your long-term and short-term tenor uh, contracts. And finally, what will really make this all much more manageable for customers is the point Utpal made around deep and liquid markets. If you have a very deep, liquid, tradable downstream market, then as a customer, you are not worried that you are carrying the volume risk associated with the contract because you've got a market downstream of you that will take the volumes if for some reason you can't offtake those volumes. So it's these three steps really. Understand your needs, look for the solution that works for you, tie up the structural demand in a long-term sense, and uh, you know as markets develop with more uh, liquidity downstream, that will again create a lot of vibrancy uh, in the contracting space for customers. Thanks, thanks, Nicole, so much for that. And before I dig a little bit deeper into the new applications for LNG, I'd just like to point out for our audience that uh, we have earmarked some time for Q&A from the audience. So please feel free to type any burning questions that you may have in the chat uh, chat of the meeting. Um, thank you. Um, so next up, I just wanted to stay on the theme of LNG and talk about new applications. And uh, I'm looking forward to hearing some thoughts from Vivek and Mr. Kumar from Gale on this. So. Um, you know, uh, it was touched upon uh, LNG being used as a fuel. So for both you, Vivek and Mr. Kumar, uh, you know, what are the different projects that uh, you are developing or have come across uh, as far as uh, small scale applications for LNG or new applications for LNG are concerned? And what are some of the challenges and enablers uh, that you are seeing which people can learn from? So uh, Vivek, maybe we start with you. Okay, thank you, Ale, once again. So probably first to set a background, I think as Petronet, we started the initiative of small scale LNG or LNG for transportation, basically for medium and heavy commercial vehicles way back in 2016-17. And uh, we started our first two buses at Dahesh Terminal and two buses at Kochi Terminal in 2019. Subsequently, we have moved to set up dispensers and we, have, uh, we are very happy to share that now very shortly we'll be commissioning four LNG dispensers in stations, three in state of Tamil Nadu, one in state of Banatka. Uh, if you look at the China, I think that they have more than 500,000 vehicles which ply on LNG. And in India, if you look at the out of total population, there is hardly any vehicle. Uh, the total population of uh, medium and heavy commercial vehicle is close to 5 million. And almost 300, 320,000 are added every year. There are very few vehicles right now which are plying on LNG. So there's a huge potential. That's what I'm trying to indicate over here that uh, uh, even if a small portion of the new vehicles are converted to LNG or uh, are made from LNG, there's a huge potential. Almost every 30,000 vehicles, 1 million ton of LNG can be consumed the way they apply in Indian road conditions. So uh, the challenges you mentioned, I think the major challenge is the converting the existing truck fleet or even the new manufacturing of vehicles 
I think uh, still people need a lot of convincing. It's still because there's no policy regime or there's no mandate like uh, Mr. Sanjay mentioned, there should be mandate to use LNG in certain sectors. So even LNG as automotive fuel is one where we feel there could be a mandate and there could be some fleet, major fleet owners could be asked to convert 20% of their fleet to LNG vehicles. That's one major challenge. Second challenge is because we operate uh, in an environment where there are city gas distribution companies, NS Petronet or IOCs or other companies set up their energy dispensing station. The issue is managing the boil off because boil off is a, something which will have to sell in the local area. And uh, if you're not in the CGD area, then you, you can, uh, if you're not uh, a CGD company, you cannot sell that gas. So I think some collaboration between CGD companies to take care of the boil off gas, which is generated out of dispensing station. Is another critical aspect which needs to be taken care of. And last but not the least, another challenge is raise, uh, or probably the opportunity is to uh, raise awareness amongst the field owners, the truck, truck drivers, uh, what are the benefits of LNG as a fuel, what uh, it is economically, as you know, it is economically advantage as well as from an environment perspective, it is very, very advantageous. So I think we need to give uh, and make people understand what is the need for LNG as a transportation fuel. And I think enabler, uh, if I think there is uh, some allocation of domestic gas, like for CNG uh, in automobiles, it is given domestic gas, similar, some allocation is given, then I think there could be an incentive for people to convert to LNG vehicles, because then at least it will pro provide a base load to operate these LNG dispensing stations. Uh, Sanjay, sir, over to you. Thanks, uh, Vivek. Thank you, Alay. Uh, Vivek has already touched upon the basic, uh, you know, issues. There is one more sector that we are working on, and which is the mining sector. So you may be aware that there are 100 ton, 200 ton and, and bigger dumpers and transport trucks, uh, which use a lot of diesel. Now, if you have been to any mining area, you would, uh, you would find out that uh, the health hazard in such areas is not only because of the dust out of mining activities, but larger so because of the diesel fumes that is emanating from those huge uh, fuel guzzlers. So we have been trying to convert uh, some of these uh, dumpers into LNG fuel. Uh, we have already done a pilot uh, project in uh, Mahanadi Coal Fields Limited. Some other players have also done the same in, in, uh, you know, in the Indian context. Uh, we hope within, uh, you know, one or two years, this becomes a viable uh, uh, fuel for the dumpers, the mining activities, or the cement transportation activities, or the other, uh, you know, uh, industrial growth areas. Now, LNG for transport, as as has been, uh, you know, mentioned by Vivek also, this has the potential to add about five to ten BCM, including the mining activities. It has potential to add about five to ten BCM. Uh, you know, annual LNG and gas consumption in the country. So uh, I'm quite sure with the kind of incentives, with the kind of push that government is giving, this sector will come up. However, there is, you know, again, the fiscal aspect of it, the taxation on these equipment, some of which are imported, it's very high. And uh, probably, uh, you know, when, when the time becomes right, we will be, uh, this, uh, the government will take a look at these. As, as part of Gale, we, in our group companies, we have already started three LNG stations, which are dispensing LNG. These are actual, you know, through the dispenser, the LNG is being sold and uh, they are being loaded into the truck as fuel. And uh, we are very ha happy about the growth that we have seen in this business. In one of the stations in Mumbai, uh, our sale used to be about five, 500, 600 kg a day. But in three, four months, it has gone up to about five tons per day. So this is a very, you know, heartening, uh, uh, this thing that we have seen. One more development that we have taken up is that there are many areas through the CGD network, the 308 uh, geographical areas, which have been authorized to different companies. Many of them are not reachable by pipeline. Even with the full national gas grid, they are being there. We do not foresee... Uh, few districts being connected through pipeline. So for them, it will be a good option to have LNG source, which is near to their geographical area. For that, we have set up uh, two small scale LNG plants in a place called Guna in India, central India. Now there, here what happens is that we, we uh, take the pipeline gas, it should be pure purified gas, 
and that gas is uh, converted into LNG, and uh, from there it is uh, sold to different uh, commercial entities who are willing to uh, buy uh, this gas. So these are the some of the new projects that we are working on. In addition, we are also trying to tweak our system, our operating system, which to enable peaking power, peaking power to be supplied, uh, you know, gas to be supplied through peaking power. You will be, uh, you know, it is, it will be heartening to note that the the RLNG or the gas for peaking power can easily consume 15 to 20 DCM per annum in the Indian context with the existing gas-based power plants. Thank you. Over to you, Alay. Uh, thank you so much for that, Mr. Kumar. Um, I did want to touch upon uh, uh, the CBG situation, but I think in the interest of uh, time, uh, maybe we can skip that for now. And uh, what I'd like is some uh, form of closing comments from everyone as we come to the end of the panel session. Um, so could each of you just share one or two points about what anyone looking at the Indian gas market should be thinking about? Uh, and I'd love for Samarji to start us off. Well, one very obvious uh, issue is, of course, gas-based power. And we all know that uh, we have around 23 gigawatts of gas-based power, which is literally sitting idle and only being used in certain summer areas. I think with the way uh, the power demand is uh, growing, and of course, renewables are coming up, but for renewables to be available for 100% of the time, it will still take some time to have the backup solutions. So I think there should be some policy to sort of revive the gas-based power, and that can be a very quick win uh, uh, in terms of reviving these plants. So uh, maybe some policy changes for uh, certain percentage of power to be from gas-based power, uh, and in our, uh, you know, search for uh, growing this uh, gas uh, percentage to 15%, that can be a very quick win. Thanks, Amarjeet. Uh, maybe we can hear from you, Utpal, uh, next. Let me just go off mute. Uh, yeah, thanks, Al. I think in a couple of things that, you know, in anybody who's coming into the gas market, if that's the question, uh, is that, look, India is a, is a, is a large market um, poised to grow over the next you know couple of decades. More importantly, it will probably keep growing even when the developed countries gas consumption starts going down as the energy transition takes into place. So you know this is a good market to be in. Uh, obviously, you know whether people will be coming into this market um, would be depending on the prevailing policies and the regulations and how it pans out over time. Uh, but there's no question that, you know, this is a, a, a you know, a large, interesting market for um, any player. Thanks, Utpal. Uh, Nakul, keen to hear your thoughts as well. Next. Yeah, I just think, uh, in my closing remarks, I'll say it's an incredibly exciting time in the Indian gas market, right? As I said earlier, we're nudging 200 million cubic meters a day um, in terms of demand. A lot of hard work has already gone in uh, from policies, regulation, market side in the last uh, few years. Um, and indeed, I think as an energy market overall, I don't see any other market anywhere around the world which is set to grow as rapidly as India over the next couple of decades. And gas within that overall energy market has a very exciting role to play as well. So if we build on all the excellent work which has been done over the last few years, We've got a tremendous set of opportunities and a very bright future for gas ahead. Thanks. Thanks so much, Nicole. Uh, Vivek, any thoughts? Thanks. I think uh, I'll just add on to what everybody has said. So three A's, we call it availability, affordability, and accessibility. I think we are well positioned on all these three aspects. I think global supplies are going to increase. LNG is going to become more and more affordable. And infrastructure creation is happening in India. So all these three A's we are meeting, and India is well positioned to achieve its target of 15% by end of this decade if if you continue to work on these three aspects more. Understood. Understood. Uh, uh, Mr. Kumar, any thoughts from you? Yeah, th thank you. Um, you know, India is the country which is aiming for 15% from 6% uh, gas in the PE mix. Now, that itself is a very exciting opportunity. We are adding more and more pipelines. Some more limbs of national gas grid will be commissioned, which will add more 
you know, demand in the in the country. The other exciting opportunity is city gas projects. City gas projects have the potential to grow to from presently, you know, about uh, 12 or 13 BCM per annum to about 50 BCM in the next seven to eight years. This is one sector where there will definitely be growth. There is already so much of uh, foreign investment, which is which we are coming to know through media reports. I believe it's it's a very uh, you know uh, promising market for any investor or anybody who is looking at it from outside India. Thank you, uh, Alay, and thank you PPAC, thank you IEA, thank you Manoj sir for uh, and the respected secretary sir for you know organizing this and giving us opportunity to share our thoughts. Uh, thank you, Mr. Kumar, for sharing your candid thoughts as well. Uh, and maybe Carol, if you can quickly close out with some comments. Yeah, um, I, I would like to um, highlight uh, the important role that uh, uh, low emission gases can play uh, in India, because everything has been said about uh, this growing market and the, uh, the LNG um, price is going down, so in the, the, the demand will uh, certainly uh, grow in. Uh, but um, I think we we should mention that uh, biomethane is um, is um, a, a green gas that can replace uh, fossil fuel in in the energy mix, and um, we see uh, that it's becoming more and more important as an alternative to fossil fuels worldwide. Um, last year, for instance, uh, the production in the world increased by twelve percent uh, and reached almost. 8 BCM, so um, uh, mainly from the US and the European Union, but I think um, uh, India has a big role to play uh, in increasing um, uh, this uh, biomethane production and the use of biomethane. Um, it can be produced from diverse sources and, for instance, waste from agriculture, and which makes a lot of sense, especially as you can use um, biofertilizers uh, that uh, you produce uh, during uh, the, uh, the biomethane production. So I, I just wanted to, to highlight uh, this. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Carol, for bringing up the topic of uh, biomethane. So um, that uh, effectively is the end of our panel session, but uh, I'd request the panelists to stay on. Um, I think maybe we can take at least one question from the audience. So the team wants to help me. Out. Yeah, we have uh, some questions that we sort of put together that we've got from the chat. Uh, maybe we can start with this one and it's open for all uh, the panelists and who would like to take this. So the question is typically what percentage by volume of Indian LNG imports are long-term contracts versus short-term contracts versus spot volumes? Is there scope to pool demand and negotiate larger volume long-term contracts, uh, similar to recent renegotiations with Qatar. Uh, Vivek, maybe okay. you might be well-placed. So if yeah. you look at today, India has long-term contracts of around 18, 19 million tons, which includes Petronet 7.5, 1.4 million tons from Gorgon, ExxonMobil. Then Gale has contracts of around 8.3 million tons, primarily from US and uh, 2.5 million tons from Cefi. Uh, GSPC has, IOC has some contracts. So all in all, they totaled around 18, 19 million tons. And uh, if we look at India's import last year, they were around 23 million tons. So roughly 60, 70% of LNG today is imported on long-term basis. And going forward also, we expect the same pattern to continue as I was mentioning. I think Nakul has a slightly different view, but it of course depends on the sector and the structure in the segment where it goes. But uh, Typically, I think for ensuring energy security of India to have a sustainable price, availability of uh, natural gas and LNG around the year without any disruptions, I think 60-70% is my take on what should be the, the long-term contracts from India's demand perspective. Sanjay, sir, I think you may like to further add. I think uh, whatever you have said is bang on. The only problem is that there is very thin line between the short-term contracts and the spot that the anonymous attendee is asking about. Got it. Um, 
Uh, should I just go ahead? We have a few more. Maybe one more. Let's take one more. Okay. Uh, so this would be nice to sort of have maybe all of you give a short remark on this question. Uh, but the question goes: How realistic is it to is to achieve fifteen percent energy natural gas mix by twenty thirty without having any significant consumption forecast from the power sector? Um, who wants to go first? Uppal, maybe you can. Sure. Uh, from 6% in 2024 to 15% in 2030, without sig significant demand from power, I think is a very, very challenging ask, if you ask me. Understood. Um, I think power is going to be a major game changer in this 6 to 15 person journey. And I think with renewables and the peak power requirement, uh, LNG is bound to play an important role. So this, and that's only when we can achieve 15%. Got it. Um, Nakul, Samarjit, Mr. Kumar, or Carol, any thoughts? I'll take the bullet. I'll bite the bullet. Uh, you know, for uh, this... Uh, 15% uh, this thing, we need to grow, grow from 60 BCM to about 150 BCM in next six, seven years. Now, this will largely come from city gas distribution projects where presently we are at about 12, 13 BCM uh, per annum. We can actually grow there if the prices are low, easily to 50 BCM. Fertilizers are likely to remain stable at about 22 BCM. The power, as everybody is talking about, although there may be some challenges related to MOD, uh, merit order dispatch uh, system that they have, but we can easily go to 30 BCM there from present about 6, 7, 8 BCM only. And still, if, if there is a kind of mandate, if they are asked to convert most of their processes into a gas process, including uh, mixing of 14, 15% of fuel in the blast furnace route, then it can easily go to 20 BCM in uh, whether it is six years or eight years that that question. Uh, uh, I don't think we should go into those finer details. We know the direction that we are talking about. Refineries can also increase there, there also we can easily go to 20 BCM because there is so much of, you know, activity going on there. Transportation fuel and mining, etc. can add uh, 10 BCM. This would actually stretch the 60 BCM to 150 BCM if you add up the maths. You know, while we were talking about, I just tried to uh, do this calculation and we can actually reach there. So your guess is as good as our guess. You have to think which sector can actually reach these, these uh, you know, levels of consumption that we can finally think of. That is the question. There is no you know, black and white answer to this question. Thank you so much, Mr. Kumar. Um, I don't know if uh, Nakul or Samarjit you want to add or even Carol, right? Uh, uh, for me, I think without power, it is going to be extremely challenging because if you see all the major LNG consuming countries, uh, almost everybody has power. And for us uh, to do it without power, I think it will it will be very, very difficult. Got it. Got it. Uh, Nakul, any thoughts? I think Sanjay ji summarized it brilliantly, uh, Alay. But to me, just one final point on this is, um, I don't obsess about the final number. It's the direction that's particularly important. I think the direction is the right direction. Um, and as Sanjay ji outlined, there are opportunities in each end use segment. What we should focus on is making sure that the potential of each segment is realized. And then eventually the numbers will look after themselves. Got it, that's a great point. Um, Carol, any thoughts? Not really, but uh, just to, to go uh, in the same direction as Nico, um, the importance is not where, um, when exactly this 15% share will be reached, but um, uh, to, to have this target is very important for India and, and the development of gas markets. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, so with that, I'd just like to once again thank all our panelists for making time and uh, been very candid in your views, so that's always very helpful. Um, I'd now like to just uh, hand it over to Dr. Sharma to help us close the event as well. Uh, thank you, Alec. Thank you. Uh, uh, I have only uh, to say that uh, beginning with the, the presentation and then remarks from Shakri and then from everyone from panel, 
what we see is that there are lot many use cases as the term used by secretary if gas is affordable uh, and it reaches everywhere uh, particularly power which everyone talks about and then transport and uh, particularly mining is very promising sector where lay, range issues are not there uh, uh, the, the most of the equipments which are actually energy or diesel guzzlers they they roam around in few uh, uh, kilometers only so uh, refilling is not issue so so many use cases are there if power, uh, gas becomes affordable with the taxation or uh, contracts or whatever means uh, uh, to the people who doubt whether we can reach 6 to 15 percent i always give example of our own gujarat gujarat already has uh, 24 percent uh, share uh, in their energy basket of gas so if, if gujarat can do uh, india can do uh, so thank you thank you everyone for joining uh, all the panel members and almost 300 uh, participants from various stakeholders uh, thank you ia thank you everyone physically here uh, thank you for the uh, taking out time and joining us thank you